life in general, one of my main philosophies is set up yourself to succeed or set yourself up to fail. And how do you do that? The six P's, which is prior planning prevents piss poor performance. You plan every step of the way as far as you possibly can. Now you can't foresee everything that can happen. There's always unintended consequences. If something goes awry, well, now your next training session, now you can be thinking of if this happens, how do I overcome it? So it's a learning experience for the dog and yourself. What works for you may not work for me. So you see all these different things and you see what you think will work for you. You could use Hickox system, perfection kennels, the Smith system, take parts of it from all of them that works for you. I don't think enough people do that. They stick with one thing and it doesn't work with their personality for training. And probably the most important thing is focus on your dog. So I can't be talking to somebody in the field and paying attention to my dog. I can't be taking pictures of my dog in the field and training my dog. I can't be hunting and training my dog. You can do one thing at a time. When you're training, it's pay attention to the dog. All right, everybody, welcome to the show for the first time. Mark Densmore. Mark, how are we doing today? Not too bad, a little too hot for my liking, but what can you do? It's that time of year. We all have to suffer through it every year. It's it's always a give take. You know, we're always excited to get to training season, but then by the time midsummer hits, it's like, when is fall and hunting season ever going to get here? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So we are going to talk about kind of a, a broad level topic today, but it's applicable really in any facet of dog training, hunting, whatever, whatever kind of development that you're trying to accomplish with your dog, the importance of coming up with plans, but being able to focus on said plans and really just being able to focus on your dog more generally. Uh, it's a topic that it, it's kind of surprising when you share a fear field or you're trying to help certain people just how little focus or attention they they actually give to what the dog is actually telling them and so you reached out with a couple suggestions uh as far as topics are concerned for this conversation and i'm excited to get to them uh but first let's start with a little bit of background and and your story and tell everybody where you're calling from and and what's kind of led you up to this point with with your uh life and dogs so to speak well, I'm in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. Um, in the six mile radius around my house, there's three other houses. So I have lots of open ground. Uh, I was in the IT world and never thought I would be doing what I do now. For years, my now ex-wife wanted a dog. I said, no, we don't have enough time. Finally, I said, okay, we have enough time. I had never hunted before, but I decided I wanted to try bird hunting. I wanted uh, the classic manner of bird hunting in my consider, my opinion, which is pointing dogs. And then I wanted a small breed dog as well. I happened to work with somebody whose wife was a breeder of Apignol Bretons, EBs or French Britneys. Although I dislike hearing French Britney. <laughs> so I ended up buying one. And that was just over, just over 20 years ago that I actually received them. At four months of age, we knew he was an exceptional dog, uh, and we just went from there. If you had told me I'd be doing what I am now back then, I'd have laughed. But Vern ended up being the first dog in UKC history to get any of their open class titles, was the first dog to get each and every one of them, was, to our knowledge, the first dog to ever, of American bred dog of the breed, to win in field competition in France. And he beat the number one French dog that year. So he didn't and it just, just went from there. So he didn't just compete over here. He competed overseas in France. Yes. It was just one trip over to France uh, for two weeks. I went with the breeder. We ran him in, I believe, seven field trials over there in that time. He got a first, a second, a third, and, and uh, a fourth. Wow. I, so, I, so, I'm curious about that process, not to not to get sidetracked too much, but, you know, sure. it, it's as par for the course on this type of podcast. You 
you going overseas to trial. I'm curious about the process. Like, was there a quarantine stage? Like, did you guys have to get there early enough to go through a certain level of quarantine? Just traveling that far for a trial. Uh, I, I have to imagine that there's some kind of red tape and bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic red tape that you have to get through to to actually take your dog that far. Very minimal. There is no quarantine. The only countries that have quarantines are like Australia, Japan, uh, in the U.S., Hawaii, New Zealand. And what do all those countries have in common or states? They're island nations. Mm. They can effectively quarantine. If you can just drive across the border, you can't quarantine. Fair enough. So you do not have to worry about that. I uh, have brought a number of dogs over from Europe, and it's, it's really a pretty easy process to do. The one thing you have to do leaving the U.S. is you have to have a uh, a health certificate, a federal health certificate, which is easy to do. You don't even bring the dog in. It's just you submit paperwork. You go to a USDA vet. They look at your paperwork. They rubber stamp it. Boom, you're done. The dog also does have to be either microchipped or uh, tattooed. Interesting. Okay. So not European field trials. Um, may or may not happen. I don't know how they do it now. I think it's more common, but they will have somebody come out and check microchips and tattoos to verify the dog is who you say it is. Gotcha. That's interesting. So not, not really too big of a headache to get over there. If you felt so inclined to travel that far to trial, I have to ask, what's the, we don't have to go into too too deep a detail here, but I'm curious, like top level, what's some of the main differences in trialing over here in the U.S. as opposed to in Europe? Well, the first one is, um, I would say, many of the trials are solo, so it's one dog running at a time and being judged. The next is the size of the trials. I was at a trial that was 150 plus dogs. All the dogs ran in one day. They break it up into groups. Each judge gets uh, 10 to 15 dogs and you go out to multiple fields. The If there's a winning dog that has uh, requirements met, they come back together, those dogs, and they go out and run what's called a barrage. And they don't even put any birds out for that. They take the dogs out, they run them, and they pick the dog that runs in the best manner of the breed. Hmm. So that's one. Second, trials are only 15 minutes long. It, they're very short. And then the level of steadiness involved, there is only one trial. We it, There is no like derby, puppy, any of that kind of stuff. It's all open class dogs. And... For that, you have, if it's a liberated trial, every bird is shot on course. They have to be 100% steady without talking to them, back if needed, and have to retrieve absolutely the hand. A wild bird trial, you don't shoot birds, obviously, because you'd wipe out every bird in the area. So it's just steady to blank, like most of the trials in the U.S. That, that's, that's the main differences. So after experiencing both, do you have a preference for one over the other, or is it just kind of each is unique in its own perspective? I would say each is unique in its own perspective. Uh, I personally don't think 15 minutes is long enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do you evaluate the run of a dog in 15 minutes or the st stamina and endurance? Um, at the same time, I like the fact that if it's a liberated bird trial, which frankly, most of them in the U.S. are, they shoot all the birds. And so a dog has to retrieve where in, you know, AKC, American Field, very little is retrieving. Now, that that makes sense. I'm curious. So obviously you, you, you mentioned before you're an EB guy. I'm curious as to why you have a preference of EB over French Brittany. We can get into that in a second. But when you're trialing over there, how many of it, what was it primarily just EBs or were there other breeds competing against you as well? Uh, only one of them, I think, was a breed specific and the others were uh, open to all breeds. As far as why I don't like French Brittany, Cape and Yobertone, translate to English, 
Spaniel of Brittany. <laughs> so it's a Brittany Spaniel, even though the AKC world says it's not a Spaniel because it's a pointer. What they fail to realize is the word Spaniel refers to its coat. It's a Spaniel-like coat. And we have multiple instances of Apignols in the U.S. The Apignol Picard or Picardy, if I want to be correct, um, and, and there's others. Picardy, Apignol Picardy Blue. There's a number. It refers to the coat type, not the, not the hunting type. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to ask that because there's there's so many examples in the gun dog world, you know, probably the most common one that people are familiar with are German wire hairs as opposed to Deutsch draw tars. And then you have the G GSPs yeah. versus the DKs and the Deutsch Kurtzars. But very often when you enter the world of the Brittany, there's there's pretty strong opinions in that world as where well, not even just the differences between a quote unquote American Brittany and an EB, but even within the EB ranks, there seems to be like very stark differences in opinion on what people really think that breed is supposed to look like. If it's a completely separate breed and, and all that stuff. I mean, there's politics and everything around every corner in the dog world that you go to, but the EB one seems like there's always, there's always a talking point from someone in, in regards to that breed specifically. Well, that's because AKC recognizes them as Britneys. They're not a distinct breed. In UKC, which all my dogs are registered UKC and they're registered AKC as well. But in UKC, there's a breed, Epignol Breton. There's also a breed, Brittany. So there is a distinction in UKC between the two breeds. If you look at the morphology of the two dogs, for the most part, they are very different. However, I do see American Britneys out there that I tell people, it must have French blood not too far back mm. because it looks similar to an, to an EB. Uh, I was once invited to bring some of my dogs to an uh, American Brittany Club uh, demonstration uh, for the show as examples of what they're not supposed to be. And when I got there, the person who was running, first thing that she told me was, you have the old style dogs. So that, that tells you something there. And if you're paying much attention to the American Brittany world right now, the breed's changing again. They're crossing pointer and setter into it, even though they will, people will vehemently argue against it. But it's plain to see. The show world, no. But the field trial world, absolutely. And there's, there's ones out there that are, have acknowledged that, yeah, they're mixes. Yeah. So I think at some point, every single breed, if you go back far enough, at some point, somebody's been screwing around with bringing fresh blood from a di different breed in it at, at some point or Absolutely. another. And I mean, even man, there, what, what do they call it? Like purpose, purpose breeding or purpose driven breeders here yeah. in the U S there's people that are still toying around with, you know, injecting different qualities or different breeds within certain ones. And, and, you know, it's that's a topic for another day. We could go down an entire rabbit hole and spend an entire hour talking on that for, by itself. A, a, ab, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the registration uh, to get a registration certificate in France and the U.S. is a very different process. Mm. In France, a litter, they get an LOF, a live birth number. They're not registered as an EB until they're one year old they have to go in front of an official confirmator that says, yes, this dog meets the minimum requirements for the breed standard. And then they, they're registered. Mm. So over there and, and a very famous dog, its sire was had pointer in it. Wasn't acknowledged for a long time, but it finally was. But the puppy, not the Bassan de Choiselle, went in front of a confirmator. And even though its sire was a uh, half pointer, it met the minimum requirements and they're okay with that as long as the, the breed standard is a, adhered to. If it varies significantly, forget it. Hmm. So really they're, they're hanging their hat on the physical breed standard makeup. So they're not too concerned with the actual pedigree or proven, you know, performance, uh, 
bona fides, but they're more just concerned of are they meeting the actual breed standard when it comes to confirmation? I would say not necessarily more concerned about that. Um, they, you know, you definitely want if you can, but the thought of injecting fresh blood in, you know, for lines that are losing, say, hunting ability, you know, you can take a show dog that doesn't have any hunt and start injecting some hunting into it and you can bring it back. So it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's something that they can do. It's not, I don't believe done very often. Yeah. Well, again, this it's really fascinating. It's hard not to just keep digging in this rabbit hole and go go yeah, deeper and exactly. deeper and deeper. So it might be something I need to revisit and circle back to at some point to to dive down into that because, like I said, a, a lot of people that think that uh, people playing around with these quote unquote pure breeds those days are over. They're they're just underground. I've heard from quite a number of people. Uh, a few of them actually wanted to come on the on the podcast, and maybe that's something that I do explore at some point to to let people know that like, hey, there's still plenty of people out there playing around with these breeds, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. It is happening, uh, whether you acknowledge it or not. Well, just remember, there's no such thing as a pure breed dog, really. All it is is a dog that breeds true to a standard. You know, EBs came from pointers and setters brought over by the landed nobility of England who couldn't bring them back, mixed with French land spaniels and other breeds. Every breed came from somewhere else. Right. You know, it just, it, it's not until the point that it can breed true, which is one of the problems with the designer breeds, like, you know, Labradoodles and all that. You can't breed true. So... Yeah. You know, uh, who knows? Maybe in 50, 100 years, they, you know, a Labradoodle will become recognized, God forbid, um, <laughs> because they can now breed consistently true. Yeah. Again, we'll have to circle back uh, on that topic in the future. But for right now, I want to go ahead and jump into this topic of, you know, really just paying attention and focusing on your dog. And, and to some, that might sound like a very broad or general statement. But I think it's a very specific thing to, at, at the very least, be a healthy reminder to others. And, and I include myself in that. To It's very easy to go out in a training and, uh, session or even a training plan, brought, more broadly speaking, and just kind of lose sight of what you're actually out there doing in the actual throes of that session. So I'm going to throw it your way because I know that you had a couple bullets and, and, and talking points that you wanted to go on. Where do you think it's best to start this conversation? Well, I think it's best to start a training with a specific goal in mind. And it doesn't matter what that goal is. But when people bring in a dog for me, I ask them, ultimately, what do you want this dog to be doing in the field? Steadiness-wise, break on flush, break on shot, completely steady. Um, retrieving, do you want the dog to be able to retrieve absolutely the hand? Does it have to back all on its own? You have to have an idea of exactly what it is that you want, or you can't really go forward. You're just kind of okay, well, this, you know, we'll, we'll just see what it does. I don't think that's the way to go. Right. And, and it, to your point, this, a specific goal, because just like anything in life, if you don't have an exact specific goal in mind, you know, something that a goal has to have is the ability to actually attain it. It has to be attainable. And so if you don't, Absolutely. if you don't clearly define the goal that you're after, like you said, to your point, let's go with steadiness. If you don't clearly define which level of steadiness you want to go to, and you're just going out there every single session, you know, today you care about steady all the way through the release. Tomorrow you only care about steady to flush or whatnot. You're never going to actually achieve the, the overall goal of steadiness because if you if you're unclear on the standards, which is really what we're we're talking about here, then there's no way the dog's gonna have the clarity on what's required and what's not. So going back yep. and forth, you you have to pick the goal and then you have to stay consistent within that goal. Yes, absolutely. 
And then I think after that, you have to break, you know, that goal down into bite-sized pieces. Years ago, I tutored math at a junior college, algebra, algebra two, pre-calc, uh, entry-level calc. And it was people that weren't very good at math, which a lot of the population isn't. I would make them write every single step down when they were solving a problem. If they changed a, a, a plus sign to a minus sign because they moved it from one side to the other, they had to write that step down. You couldn't just jump things intuitively because when you do that, your intuition may be wrong and you have to understand what it is you're doing. And the same applies to training. You have to know what you're doing and, you know, and with that have expect a realistic expectations for those things. Yeah. And you're, you're speaking to me on that. Cause I remember back in school to go to continue with the math analogy. I was, I was always just the guy that, you know, math came very natural to me. I was able to mm -hmm. just, you know, I was very quick to pick up anything mathematical. And so it's very easy to somebody, you know, you're staring at a test and you have a mathematical problem. Here's the answer. Well, where's your steps? Where's your work? It's like, ah, oh, that doesn't yep. matter. And I, that used to frustrate me, especially in like middle and high school. I'm like, why do I have to show my work if I'm giving you the correct answer? But to your point, when you start getting into advanced level mathematics, you start, you know, when you go to college and you're getting into some advanced, you know, fill in the blank calculus, trigonometry, whatever, if you're not used to breaking it down into those individual steps, by the time that you jump to an answer intuitively, and you get it wrong, you have no idea where in that process the disconnect happened, right? Like you just kind of jump from square one to square 10, you get the wrong answer and you messed up on, you know, step six or seven. And, but instead you're going all the way back to the start to figure out where did we go wrong? Exactly. So you, you have to double the work because yeah, you did it once. Now you got to go back and do it all over correctly. Yeah. So it's just, Dog world is the same way. If you just jump to things and it doesn't work, like you had a uh, guest on, uh, I think the last podcast, perhaps, that was talking about, you know, have to break it, you know, down so the dog understands what it is. So, I, and I think that's very important um, to do. Like I'm working on a dog right now that I own that does not like the back period. And, but he was woe broke. So you can stop him with an e collar all the way, but it doesn't matter. As soon as you go to a trial, he's going to break. So I had to stop, go all the way back. And I do one step, toss the bird. I don't shoot. I don't fire a gun, just toss the bird. Once he's consistent on that, now I'll introduce the shot. Once he's consistent on that, I'll go to a backing dummy with him on a check cord once he's, you know, and it just, as you can see, it's a process. It's all a process, you know, or methodology, right? You know, I'm a big one for methodologies that it doesn't matter what it is as long as it works. And if it doesn't work, flexibility to adapt to the you know new situation. Right. There's a process from getting from point A to point B. And yep. the the backing example, I like that example because it's very cut and dry. You can you can break it down. But you know, this goes into more than just troubleshooting issues. Uh I think you're referring to the episode that I did with Ben Fretz where we started breaking down like yep. how do you troubleshoot where an undesired behavior begins and where exactly. it stems from. And so and that is and that is the episode. OK, so and this backing example is another good one to where it doesn't matter if it's backing. I think of that example, we were talking about chomping birds on the retrieve. Uh, yep. Pick your behavior with these dogs. It's the same process no matter what. And that's what I tell everybody. Like if you focus on the principles, then the methodology to your point, that's just the process that you go about going through it. The principles are still there and the principles are break it down into small little chunks, small individual steps, isolate what you're working on to 
let's continue on the backing example to where you had a dog that was woe broke. You can stop him with the e-collar. You could use woe. He could stop. But then you have an issue when you get into the trial and you don't have an e-collar and you can't verbalize the woe. So we have to go back and we have to take the behavior, the woe, which is already there, and we have to then create that and overlay that behavior with the flushing of a bird. Then we overlay that with the visualization of a dog on point. And I'm kind of speeding through. We can break down each one of yeah. these into yep. individual steps. But this is how I tell everybody, once you start understanding how to actually develop a behavior in a dog for it to make sense to that individual dog, it doesn't matter what you're after. You could be training backing. You could be training retrieving. You can be training the dog to go to the fridge and get you a beer. Either way, the process is the same. You back up and you just, how do I break this up into individual steps? And then you, you're you starting to understand then how to really train these dogs or at the very least troubleshoot and show your work to where if you have an issue, the dog's not backing, you can go all the way back to where the disconnect happened. And instead of you going back and retraining woe in this example, it's like, no, we have the woe. Let's just build up that association with the woe to the flushing of a bird. Yeah, and if you're going to have them retrieve a beer from the fridge, um, hopefully they have a very soft mouth. <laughs> hey, if it's a glass bottle, right, you know, hopefully they don't be dropping it and then you got beer everywhere, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah. then, so, so you have to understand what your goal is. Then you do, you have... In life in general, one of my main philosophies is set up yourself to succeed or set yourself up to fail. And how do you do that? Well, it comes into something I think I brought to your attention for the first time, the six P's, which is prior planning prevents piss poor performance. You have to figure out what is my goal on this training session? What do I need to do on this training session? It, you plan every step of the way as far as you possibly can. Now, you can't foresee everything that can happen. There's always unintended consequences. But you plan for as much as you can. <clears throat> if something goes awry, which is something you couldn't plan for because it never occurred to you, well, now your next training session with the dog on that same thing, now you can be thinking about that as well. If this happens, how do I overcome it? So it's a learning experience for the dog and yourself. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much exactly where I was headed is, you know, very often when you tell somebody go into each session with a very specific plan and it takes practice. You have to get used to the fact that like you're dealing with an animal, a live, living, independent, breathing animal. They have a brain of their own. Outside factors can can come in uh, to the equation. What I'm getting at is the plan can deviate and you have to be able to go with the flow to where you don't the, the training session isn't a complete loss. You don't want the train to come off the tracks here uh, because I think a lot of people, they will come up with the plan. And just because they have it in their head of going a certain way, hell or high water, that's how they're going to go through that session with that dog. And sometimes you do need to be able to deviate and go with what the dog is telling you. And that's why I think just coming up with the plan, you also need to really think and try and anticipate what can go wrong. What could the dog potentially do in each one of these situations? And you can't you can't forecast that without having that specific plan in mind, right? Like if you're just going out there, like I'm going to go yep. make it up as I go out there and the dog completely like goes right when you wanted them to go left and you haven't given any of this, any forethought or consideration, you're standing there. I'm like, man, you're losing valuable time and mm -hmm. timing and consistency is everything in this game. Yes. And you're confusing the dog when you're confused. The dog is confused. And another one of the big things I am about is adaptability. As I said, Darwinism, adapt or die. <laughs> and you have to you have to be willing to change to meet the circumstances. Yes, absolutely. I mean, 
The adaptability question, that is a tough one to get because, you know, all the time, especially new new per- people that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. If you're on your first or second dog, perhaps, it's it's hard to explain to somebody, like, go out with a very specific goal in mind, but then if the the dog needs you know let's let's say i want to i'm trying to think of a good example here let's say that we planted some birds and we're wanting to work steadiness but really the conditions just don't really offer it that way the wind is horrible maybe it's too hot mm-hmm. what have you so you need to it's like well i have birds planted that maybe this is your only day of the week that you can actually go train your dog right so it's like all right well you need to get something in so being able to adapt And instead of not training your dog in the field that day, maybe instead of working steadiness, you can deviate and go work stop to flush, which is still steadiness, but it's just not in scent. It's around scent, right? So that's what I'm, that's what I try and communicate to people is like, you don't have to not train, but to your point, you can either set yourself up for success or you can set yourself up for failure. And if you have all week in your head, Saturday morning, we're training steadiness and you go put five pigeons out and launchers out there, but you're looking at the conditions and there's zero mile an hour wind and it's already 80 degrees, you're setting yourself up for failure if you're going to go out there and try to try to work steadiness in a traditional sense. Meanwhile, you can still work steadiness just through a different lens and a different approach. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or throw a check cord on the dog and let them get really close to the bird, right. which is good training because that kind of stuff happens. Yes. So you just adapted it a little bit. Yep. Now, conversely, the other side of it, you have the people that at, I mean, at any chance, they're going to full on change their approach or adapt. It, it, like they... Mm-hmm. It's challenging when you're when you're trying to help somebody and every time you speak with them or every time you're in the field with them, they're going about it in a completely different manner. They don't give the plan or the steps the chance to work. They don't surrender to the process for lack of a better term. And so they mm-hmm. kind of they kind of just go with the wind. You know, it, it's like whatever Facebook post they read that week or whichever trainer they heard on a podcast, it's you know, going back to you set your specific goal up, you also have to give the plan a chance to work or not work. I'm not saying stick to your plan for months on end with no results, but you also can't just with, with every blowing wind completely change directions. No, because every day is different. I had a customer once that got a dog from me. That dog went to five different trainers and he told me that his Sons hated to hunt with that dog because it was just, it didn't know what it was doing out there. Finally, he stuck with one trainer. That dog, as far as I know, is the only two-time NASA champion now. He's one point away from his three-time. And, you know, he finally found, he, well, I told him, I said, you're switching too much. Booty's not going to know what's going on. You need to find one and stick with it for a, a good period of time and let him figure things out. And lo and behold, that actually, actually worked for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it's again, it's one of those things that like, you really just kind of need some experience in the field with these. And this is also why I go back to like the most valuable thing you can do when trying to learn how to train your dog is go help other people train their dogs mm-hmm. and, and just share a fear field with them. See as many reps and as many approaches as you can see in this. Now that again, that doesn't mean that you try and emulate or, or copy everybody's uh, process. But you, you ha- still have to make it your own, but it's going to drastically increase the slope of your learning curve exponentially if you're just yep. going out there and helping other people. It seems counterintuitive. It's like, well, what do I have to offer to help other people? And it's like, that's just when you ask the person, what do you need help with? Do you need a bird planner? Do you need a gunner? You know, fill in the blanks, whatever. But the more time you can spend in the field with as many different people and as many different dogs, that's that's going to help you establish your goals as well as your plan. And not only that, what works for you may not work for me. So you see all these different things and you see what you think will work for you. So, you know, you could use, 
you know, Hickox system. You could use perfection kennels, the Smith system, and take parts of it from all of them that works for you. And, and, and I don't think enough people do that. They stick with one thing and their, their personality, it doesn't work with their personality for training. Right. So, you know, I understand, I understand your limitations. Right. I, you know, I've been saying this quite a lot on, on recent episodes is, you know, we're, we're always really quick to say that every dog is different. And, and of course, every dog is different. Mm -hmm. They all have strengths and weaknesses, but I'm, I'm starting to, to consider the possibility that when it comes to training these dogs, it's not so much the difference in the dogs that matter. I mean, there is an element of that, but it's the difference mm -hmm. in the trainers and handlers because going, circling back to a point you made earlier if it doesn't make sense to you, the handler, you can't make it make sense to the dog. And so starting from that point, if you're going about this and you don't have your plan or your plan doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't matter what type of dog you have. It, it could be the exact type of dog you need for this program or method, or it might not be. If you're confused on it, it's not, it doesn't matter about the dog. That's why it always starts and comes back to the handler for me is if you don't have a clear goal in mind or, or a clear vision of what you're doing, it doesn't matter the dog. And that's, you know, I say all the time, like when you're pointing at the dog, you have three more fingers pointing right back at you. And, uh, you know, it's this, the, again, it goes back. I'm kind of just repeating myself now as it goes back to spend as much time in the field with people as you can. But to your point, find that trainer, find that system that makes sense to you and do a deep dive. Understand that process from start to finish and all of it. And if you have any questions, that's where the helpers, the mentors, what have you, that's where they are uh, for a sounding board and to help you out. Yep. And then the next and probably the most important thing is focus on your dog. Too many people do not focus on their dog. Uh, I've had people tell me, well, I can multitask. I can be talking and focusing on my dog. Sorry, not true. The human brain cannot multitask. Uh, I have a customer who's going to be getting a dog from me next week. He's a neurosurgeon in New York. I was speaking to him a couple nights ago. And I've been telling this people for years, you can't multitask. And I, he, this guy's a neurosurgeon, so he knows his stuff. I asked him about it. He goes, no, except for uh, autonomous functions like your heart beating, which is a separate area of the brain controls, period. You know, so it's not conscious level. You can't do it all. We do things sequentially. So I can't be talking to somebody in the field and paying attention to my dog. I can't be taking pictures of my dog in the field and training my dog. I can't be hunting and training my dog. You can do one thing at a time, and that is it. And, and when you're training, it's pay attention to the dog. I have people all the time come out, and we'll be, run, you know, we'll take them out, and I'll say, okay, the bird is over there. It's planted over there. Tell me exactly when that dog makes scent. 90% of them, well, maybe not quite that high, 80% cannot tell you that because they don't focus on the dog. They're not looking for that split second where that head comes up just a little bit, the eye shift, something of that nature. Or if you have a dog that is blinking back like Otis is, okay? I see immediately when he does it. So I know that at that point, I have to do something. If you don't know what your dog is doing, you don't know that it just made game. You know, you can't be prepared. If you, what the dog is on point and you can't see because you're not watching intently, the muscles tense up, which tell you that the dog's about to break. Focus on the dog. Um, often, yes, I think it helps to have two people out there. Um, but I almost always train by myself, even with two out there. I have somebody plant the birds for me and do things like that to speed things up. But I am the one that's 
going to handle that dog and pay 100% attention to that dog. And I'm not going to talk to that other person. I'm just going to watch what that dog is doing. So I'm prepared. Yeah. And part of being prepared for me, if it's steadiness work and they're uh, woe broke, I, or even on a run, I have the transmitter in my hand 100% of the time. If it's one dog out there, my thumb is actually, I, I use a four dog collar, so I, it's four buttons. I have my thumb on the button for that dog with the level set that I think I need at that point. So as soon as something happens, I don't have to fumble for something on my neck or my belt or anything like that. I am prepared for it to happen. Yeah. And I don't want to say that I anticipate it, but I'm ready for it at the same time. Uh, that's exactly what I was just about to say. Instead of reacting, you're almost anticipating what the dog yep. is going to do. And and again, that comes from reps and experience in the field. And it's funny, you know, you, you said something that I'm very similar in when I'm in the field with, with multiple people, whether it's two or three or four people, it doesn't matter. I, I am a, an advocate of if you're running your dog, the only thing that I like to have a second person involved in the training sequence in that s situation help with is gunning. You know, I, I'm all about pay yes. attention to your dog and you have a separate gunner over here. That way you don't even care what happens to the bird. Whatever happens is beyond your control, but you are 100% focused on your dog. And to me, part of that is you have the e-collar remote you have the launcher remote because at the end of the day, my timing on the launcher remote, my buddies laugh at me because I am very flighty on that bird to your point. Like if, if, if I see that dog catch scent and they don't check up or they avoid it or whatever, I'm launching that bird. I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Yep. And I tell everybody I can run the remote for you. And I know a lot of people, especially if you go to a training day, uh, somebody's not comfortable using the e-collar remote. So they'll hand it off to somebody else. I get that. And, and, you know, maybe that's what needs to happen on this one specific run just to get quality reps out. But I also remind them, like, you're never going to develop the timing that's necessary to do this if every time you're handing off the launcher or e-collar remote or blank pistol or what have you. Uh, if you're going to be training the dog, you need to take ownership of this process and this timing and really the only one that I still say, like, you know, hand it off to somebody else or have a helper is if you have another gunner, because at the end yep. of the day, when it's time to shoot a bird, you still need to be paying attention to your dog. And we all suck natural, like our natural instinct is to watch that bird fly away for whatever reason you can have the dog mm -hmm. on point. We still want to watch that pigeon fly away, even though we've watched a thousand of them fly away. That is just the yeah. natural urge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's funny you brought that up is is because you see that example all the time is like, hey, can you handle this remote? And it's like, I can, but you're never going to develop that skill set to do that unless you and take when it. You, okay. And when you were saying that, that was the exact thing that came to mind was how are they going to learn if they don't do it themselves? Are they going to make mistakes? Absolutely. But I'm a firm believer you don't learn anything if you don't make a mistake because there's nothing because you did it correctly. So you didn't learn anything new. Right. You have to mistake, make mistakes to learn new things. Yes. Fail and don't be afraid to make them. Failure is the best teacher. I'm sorry. You can go out there and if you have a dog that is a successful 100% of the time, just boom, 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 boom. We may like it. It's like, all right. But if you mm -hmm. never have that chance for, at a correction or learning what can, can go wrong, you, I could say that you're technically not learning anything. And, uh, yep. you know, we go out there hoping that we don't make mistakes, but also we have to know that that is part of the process. And, and I, I do want to circle back on the multitasking thing, because this is something that I've been kind of thinking about myself is I've, I've struggled, you know, we all have a million things to do in life. Right. And so we try and be m the most efficient in the, any of the processes, not just training, but work and around family and everything. And I would agree with you to where 
I think this is semantics. I think multitasking is a real thing, but I'm going to say whatever you're multitasking in, you're you're going to do a half-assed job at any of the things that you're actually trying to do all at one time. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything successful or to the best of your ability by multitasking. And I'm constantly, even though I recognize that, I am still messing it up and still I find myself thinking like, oh, I can edit this episode while writing this blog, while sending this email, while planning my dog's training session for tomorrow. And then I come out to where I just spent four hours getting 20% of each task done to where if you sit down and just focus on one thing, you can knock out any one of those things in a half hour and then move Mm -hmm. on to the next one. But we want to just try and do it all at one time. And it's a struggle that I find myself even in my training sessions to where especially if it's going good, this is where I'm getting to is making mistakes, making errors almost forces me to pay attention to the dog, focus on on the dog a little bit more to where if I'm having a session that's going too good, you know, you kind of get in that flow, that rhythm. And next thing you know, your head's checked out and you've lost focus on what it's, what's happening. And and when you kind of come to, it's already too late. Your dog's already made two or three or four mistakes and you miss that opportunity to where if you're, if you're in the session, if you're present and mindful of what's going on in front of you, you don't miss those opportunities or those reps because you're right there with the dog in real time. And I personally don't want a dog that is perfect in training because I, you know, I don't know about you. You you may be perfect. I know I'm not, I'm going to make mistakes. So if I have a dog that's perfect in training, I know it's going to make a mistake at some point. And at some point, maybe when this bird gets up while I'm hunting or I'm in a trial, it's going to be at an inopportune time. So I want those mistakes made where I can work on correcting them beforehand. Yes. Um, I don't expect my dogs to be perfect before I move on to the next step. Uh, I, I met, met George Hickox uh, a number of years ago, and his philosophy is move on to the next step when the dog's consistent. Well, then the question is, what is consistent? Eight out of 10, 80% is consistent. And if you're achieving that, you can do it. And I will literally count how many times a dog does something. You know, I'm going one of one, two of two. You know, I, I, I have that in my mind. But circling back just a little bit, that's usually spread out over a period of time. I don't believe in doing too much at one time. It, it, you're setting the dog up to fail when you're pushing it to failure. So I, I use what I refer to as the rule of threes on birds. Three launchers out there. The dog handles the first one. We go to the second one. The dog handles the second one. Boom, we're done. Dog doesn't handle the first one correctly. We go on the second one. It doesn't handle that one. Boom, we're done. It, the third one only ever comes into play is if one is handled correctly, one is not. Then I'll go on to the third one because I'm looking what the consistent pattern is. But that's it. The, a dog has roughly the intelligence of a two to three year old child. What is a two to three year old child's uh, attention span? <laughs> if you're, you know, you take a pile of dummies and throw a hundred dummies, you think that dog got bored and may never want to do it again. It applies to birds, it applies to everything. You can't do it too much before the dog gets burnt out on it and may never want to do it again. Yeah. So stop all your head. Don't push the failure. Yeah. You know, there, there's a word called proofing, right? You know, back to your mm-hmm. example of we don't want a perfect dog in training. Anybody that, that comes to me and they, they're like, yeah, you know, we did force fetch on the table and the dog was perfect. They never messed it up on the table. I'd say, well, then you didn't set it up right. We don't want to yeah. set them up for failure like every time. Like we don't want to make it a, a, like an unscalable task 
you mm-hmm. have you have to give them the opportunity for success. But if you if your dog did not fail, you did not proof it, you did not test it. So you can use whatever acronym or or analogies or whatever you want to call it. You know, I used to say all the time, teach, train, test all the time. Well, you know, you teach it, then you rep it over and over and over again, but then you have to test it. You have to put them in a situation to where they can fail to solidify that behavior. And, the, you know, the other way now people are talking about, you know, tr- uh, teach or develop and then generalize and then proof it. That's The proof is the same thing as the testing. If you don't put your dog in enough random situations or enough environments with enough different contexts or criteria, then you just haven't solidified the behavior enough for that dog to give you failure. And to your point, until you can get that dog over the failure, you don't have a solid proven behavior by that dog because it may handle this in a perfect setup situation and scenario. But what happens that the second a curveball comes at at them, the second the conditions aren't right, the second there's a distraction over here or a or a dog off leash comes into the equation or, you know, whatever you can you you can fill in the blank with whatever imaginative situation you can come up Mm -hmm. with. But the point is, is if you were sitting there like, man, this was too easy. My dog never made a mistake. Right. It is your job as the trainer to put them in a situation to where it is tough enough so that they can make the mistake and then they Mm -hmm. can come through. And that's also it's the same reason why we say we don't want our children living in a bubble. Right. They have to be able to make a mistake, fall on their face and get back up because if you go out there on a trial or test or a hunt and your dog's never been faced with uh, just a, a, a almost perfect scenario and all of a sudden they're in that scenario, they don't have the mental gumption to actually make their way through it. Absolutely. And, you know, using wool breaking for an example, I take a dog out for a run, say a two mile run, a mile out, mile back. I will stop that dog for no reason, two or three times out, two or three times back. But I'll also, once that's consistent on that, where I know it's going to happen, what do I do next? I throw a dog out there that's uh, a distraction. A young dog that is going to see that dog standing, go over there like I have a four-month-old puppy right now. He sees a dog standing, he's going to go over there and grab on that ear. And that dog still has to stand there, even with all that external stuff going on. So I want those distractions to teach the dog that it has to be there. And they're not going to stand there the first time a puppy comes up and grabs under the ear and starts running with that ear in its mouth. But they have to learn that things like that happen. I had a field trial once where my dog was on point. Uh, It was a wild bird trial. I see the bird up ahead, a hen pheasant laid flat out on the ground, wings out flat on the ground and had a young one with it. My dog went on point, that hen pheasant got up and ran at my dog. Just before it got to her, broke off. What happened? My dog broke to chase it. You have weird things that happen all the time. Now, I don't think you could possibly train for that, but at least you're cognizant the next time you see something like that, that if, if it was even a field trial and that was to happen the next time, I'm going to yell whoa at my dog. Yeah, it's it's done. That's fine. But I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell my dog no. So it learns not to do that. Yeah, you can't you can't cover all the bases. You can't you can't handle every contingency in a training environment. I mean, there. let's face it. There are some situations when you're dealing with dogs and birds and conditions. We can't we can't simulate. You know, we can do the best of of our ability, but there's also situations to where, I mean, there are some things that are just really, uh, honestly, just kind of simple to understand. I mean, I hear all the time, every single year around the NAVDA Invitational, somebody's going to go there and they have so many birds planted out there. You're talking an hour long brace. You have birds that aren't found. You have birds that aren't shot. They survive, whatever. Somebody always comes away talking about how, 
their dog couldn't handle the amount of birds in Mm -hmm. the field or the birds were running because they were so plentiful, what have you. That's why when you're training steadiness, you shouldn't only train steadiness with launched birds. You shouldn't train steadiness with the same exact planted birds. You should be coveying up birds. You shouldn't do it on just one bird. You shouldn't do it out in the middle of a green field 100% of the time. Change it up, randomize it. That's part of the proofing process. But then mm-hmm. also the conditions. This is I, I literally just a few years ago, uh, a utility test. I watched uh, a, a person go out there and she had a prize one level Vishla. I mean, she just did. She crushed the field, crushed everything. She was the last one on on the duck search, and she just she goes and she's about to send the send the dog, and all of a sudden lightning hits and this random thunderstorm just happened to to hit right when she was sending the dog off and no joke i mean it was like perfect timing when she sent that dog the heavens opened up and it just started pouring on her and when they told her to bring the dog back in the rain stopped and she failed the duck search because of that she never she had never trained the duck search in any rain and it really threw Mm -hmm. the dog off rightfully so you can't blame the dog and so And then, I mean, I think it was like the next week, it may have been two weeks, she found another test and went and got her max score on utility test. But you never know the conditions uh, of which you're going to actually be tested in or hunting in. And that's why it's like, you know, maybe ask around the people that are doing whatever activity or goal that you're after. If you, if your goal is a versatile champion in NAVDA, go ask around. You know, there's plenty of people with crazy stories. I remember my buddy Nate, I sat there and watched my first invitational I was volunteering at. It was at the blind. And I remember he sent the dog and a flock of Canadian geese just flew right <laughs> over the dog's head right after he sent them. And it threw the dog off. And I believe, if I mm-hmm. remember correctly, the dog failed the, the blind because of that. Uh, you know, plan for all contingencies. Now, in that scenario, how do you plan for a Canadian goose to, or Canada goose? Sorry, I know somebody just threw something at the at the radio for getting Canada that wrong. Geese. Yeah, Canada geese. How, <laughs> how can you simulate a group of honkers going over that dog on a blind retrieve? You know, maybe that's something that you need to, I don't know, get creative, set up launchers and throw some, you know, flyaway birds while you send them on a blind mm. blind retrieve. I just made that up, com- made that up. Somebody out there is like, that's a horrible idea. OK, well, you know, that on the spot, that's what I came up with. But that's the type of thinking you need to have when it comes time to start proofing and randomizing the dog's training. Yeah. And, and I and I think your example would work. Have three or four winger zingers with dead ducks loaded in them with the, you know, where it's quack. You can hit the quack. It's quacking and launch all of them at the same time over the dog as you send. Yeah. Yep. All the conditions are, it doesn't know, the dog doesn't know it's dead. (laughs) Right. It just knows birds are going over and quacking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good and, idea there. And, and to me, that's also part of the fun of training. If it was the mm-hmm. same training day in, day out, I would get bored with it, right? Like if the dog's perfect and we just, you know, do a cookie cutter setup and we just run through it every single day, I would get bored. And part of the fun is coming up with the unique situations or unique solutions to that individual dog. Uh, in mm-hmm. any given situation is get creative and you know what you know sticking with this it's like all right if we launch some dead ducks and it and it really like we it was too much too soon the dog veers off the blind and goes and picks up the dead duck and brings it back like mm-hmm. all right well maybe let's just start off with just the quack maybe let's start yeah. off with a flyaway pigeon that we don't have to worry about the dead bird falling in the water and distracting them you know again just like everything else chunk it down into individual little steps and yep. go from there. And if you need to adjust fire, adjust fire. And that's the benefit of going at a slow, steady, methodical pace. No step is too far to ha- not be able to come back from, right? Like right. you're not asking too much to where that dog is not going to have a, a one-time, one-off learning experience to where you can't come back from it. Right. And to your point where you said, I get bored. What do you think your dog, what's happening with your dog? Do you <laughs> right. think your dog didn't get bored, you know, two steps before that? 
And that goes back to, you know, focus on your dog. You should be able to see when your dog is starting to get bored. It will loosen up. It will not, you know, if it's on a bird, it, the point is not going to be intense. If it's on a back, it's not going to be backing intensely. It's not going to be running the field as hard. You, that is where you have to be paying that much attention to your dog so you can see those minor things. Because dogs are about one thing in relating to humans and, and relating to other dogs or animals. And that is body language. They show everything by body language. Well, not everything. Aggression can be barking too, but, but most everything is body language. If you're not paying attention to your dog, you can't see that body language and what it's trying to tell you. Yeah. And that goes both ways too. not just the body language and the dogs, the dogs, oh. the dogs can tell your body language even better than we can read their body language because we're more verbal creatures. We just are dogs are more perceptive of body language because they're forced to, right? Like they have to pay Absolutely. attention to the body language. And so, and I'm not talking about just, you know, I think a lot of people's mind or at least mine probably uh, immediately goes to like frustration. The dogs pick up on anger or something like that, but they also pick up on when you're not paying attention, when you're bored, right? Like when you're just indifferent yep. to whatever, they also pick up like when you're overly excited. And that's why a lot of, the trainers, the the better trainers, I would say, uh, the ones that I admire and the ones I try and emulate, I would say I, I use the word stoic almost. Like they're almost emotionless when they're dealing with their dogs. They're just even keeled. They're monotoned. And that way, when they do need to ramp it up or tone it down, they can. They have that even baseline and the dogs find comfort in that. They know hey, not only is this setup consistent, not only is what he's asking of me consistent, but my leader, my handler is consistent in how he's holding himself. Like, And, and that's going to give your dog a certain level of comfort in every single situation. Yeah, I was at a seminar once with Rick Smith and he said, okay, here's me when I'm frustrated telling a dog, whoa, whoa. Here's me when I'm excited telling the dog, Whoa, whoa. You know, it doesn't matter what you feel, you have to convey it. And it takes a lot of work for us that if we're frustrated, not to tense up. And you are exactly right. They pay way more attention to our body language, and, and we have to re be aware of that. Because I find myself tensing up at times, you know, be, uh, Field trials are a good one where you, you know, you want your, your dog goes on point, you start coming in and you start to tense up because you don't want anything to happen. And you have to just go, oh, wait a second. And people will say, well, the dog's paying attention to the bird. Wrong answer. That dog, just you're walking, you can feel the ground. If you're frustrated, you're walking differently. Every, everything is different. Or, you know, when I'm hunting or training, I don't talk to my dogs, period. I don't say a word to them. And I'll demonstrate the new people because they're talking all the time to their dog. And I said, okay, we're going this way. Let's turn 90 degrees. I'm not going to say anything to my dog. 200 yards out, my, and my dogs will range a good quarter mile out. And I'll turn. It doesn't matter how far away I am. I'll turn and start walking. And that dog will turn because it knows it's supposed to go up, be in front of me. And that's because it's paying attention to me. And we're a team out there. I have to pay attention to it. The dog has to pay attention to me. You don't need to talk. To it. If I'm in like a UKC field trial, they want more quartering. Okay, my dog's running pretty straight, lying out ahead of me. I'll turn 90 degrees and start walking a few steps that way. The dog will turn and go that way. Then I can turn and go the other direction to get it, you know, to get it. I'm, I'm actually giving a command without giving it a command. So realize your dog knows everything you're doing out there. Yes. I mean, essentially you're cueing the dog to go left or right. Yep. I mean, there's a reason yep. why, I mean, 
you know, we want to talk about the principles and the common threads between every approach, every method, every organization, every testing environment. There's a reason why the whole come go with me is in every single one of those scenarios, because it does come down to the cooperation of your dog. And that comes down to the relationship with your dog. If you don't have your dog's attention, if they're not paying attention to your body language, then essentially you don't have a relationship with that dog. They either don't respect you or they don't like you. What you know, you can fit fit in whatever you know uh, adjective or description that you want in this scenario. But at the end of the day, this is why we talk about the short grass bleeds over into the tall grass. Right. Mm -hmm. if, if you do your, your obedience, if you do things in the house, that builds the relationship to where what you do, what you're you are doing, that matters to the dog. Because if, if it doesn't matter to the dog, then they're not going to pay attention to you when they're 200 plus yards out in the field. If they can't, mm -hmm. if you can't keep your dog's attention and their focus in the short grass for 15 minutes and you go out there in the field and that dog knows, hey, there's a lot of fun stuff called birds out here in this field. Yeah, I don't know where yeah. there are, but I'm going to go find them. You think that they give a darn what you're doing or where you're going? They don't. That's why we talk about it's so important to develop that relationship with the dog to where not only are they paying attention to you, but they want to pay attention to you because good thing good things happen from you. You and him, the dog share a vested interest and in let's go find mm -hmm. birds. And by enough reps and association, they start to begin to associate you with birds, right? They It doesn't mm -hmm. do them any good to go find and point a bird if you're not around. And, it, and it's just working with that shared interest and common goal. I'm not one to believe that the dog is out there hunting to make you happy, but I am one to believe that that dog wants that bird and they do start to understand they don't get that bird without you. Mm hmm. And, you know, and you were talking about, uh, you know, keeping track of you and coming back. I think, you know, it, when people get puppies, I think they put too much obedience on puppies. Mm -hmm. I had a dog come in once for training because it wouldn't leave the handler's side. Well, he lived in, in, a, in a big city and was always on a leash. Come hunting time, where was it? Right at heel. After a month, I got that dog finally running. He picked up that dog. It went right back to that behavior. I have a four-month-old right now. He's, well, I take it back. He's been on a leash once to go into the vet to get a rabies shot. Never been on a leash. He's outside in the yard. He's running around. People worry, you know, they're, I want that dog close by. Uh, I'm afraid I'll lose him. You're not going to lose the puppy unless that puppy doesn't like you. And that's where, when you said doesn't like you, that's what made me think of this. Mm -hmm. I want that dog to be bold and confident on its own. Because what's the most important thing uh, a pointing dog has to want to do? Go hunt. Find birds. Search. Find yeah. birds. Exactly. People will think retrieving. Retrieving is the, la the least important thing on a pointing dog. Because if it doesn't do any, any of the other steps ahead of it, it's not going to have a chance to retrieve. You you just and with a young dog, if you restrict it too much at a young age, I'm sure you've heard the rope theory before. Yeah, you can pull a rope in, but you can't push a rope out unless it's wet and frozen. <laughs> but you know that's not going to happen. I can handle a dog to be close, but if they learn to never go more than 15 yards from me, good luck at getting to go out. Yeah. It's possible, but it takes a tremendous amount of work. So. I personally, until they're about one year of age, other than recall, the call when I come, and I e collar condition them at about five months old. And it's not because I want that dog close by. It's I've sold six dogs hit and killed by cars chasing rabbits or something. I want that collar on it and be able to call it in for safety purposes. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the obedience. I don't teach dogs to heal at a young age. I don't want them being dependent on me. I want them being bold and confident. Yes. And you're you're a source of almost comfort or at least leadership. And yeah. and, and you ultimately, I got to be careful because if I go down this rabbit hole, this will be a whole nother hour long gripe session <laughs> because ultimately you, you did just nail and, and hit on my personally, my biggest pet peeve in the gun dog world. 
is I think too many people fail to recognize the difference in pointing or versatile dogs, if you want to use that nomenclature, and retrievers, because you're talking two completely different initial behaviors. If you're talking about labs and retrievers in the true sense of what they're supposed to be, they are more dependent dogs. That's why when you talk to those guys, they are the guys that get the puppies six to eight weeks old and they're requiring sit, they're requiring place, they're they're asking a lot more obedience to whereas when we're dealing with pointing dogs and versatile dogs, we need that higher level of independence for them to go search and hunt. We don't always want their default and their first instinct to always be stay near dad you know, Mm -hmm. whatever he does, like I need to stay here. I think that there is a way to do obedience with these young dogs, but not in the sense that the way that maybe the retriever folks do. And, and, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm real quick, like it's not, it's not a knock against retrievers and it's not a knock against the pointing dog guys. Just recognize it's a two, it's two completely different games in my opinion. So if you have a German short hair, and you are taking your dog to a pro trainer, don't go to just your tried and true retriever guy. He's not going to develop the dog the same way that you need him to. I I hear from listeners all the time that have issues with the dog won't go hunt or the trainer told them to come pick up their short hair because there's something wrong with the dog. I'm like, no, you're, you're asking somebody to do something that they're unfamiliar with. And while mm-hmm. I believe dog training is dog training, you still have to recognize that there is a different purpose for the breed and the game that you're going to go pursue. And so you can do obedience with these pointing dogs, but to your, to your point, I mix it up. I tell everybody to balance it out. If you're going to, to do obedience, which I'm a believer in doing obedience, not too much too soon and not punishment wise, but balance it out to where, okay, we're going to work on kennel. Go to your kennel. Go away from me. Mm-hmm. Then work recall to where the behavior is coming to me. Then work place, which is duration, just staying still. And then, you know balance it out to where everything that you're doing is go away from me, come to me, stay there, go back away from me to where your dog Mm -hmm. isn't automatically, if all you do is recall, then heal. And then, whoa, all you're doing is creating a dog whose first default and instinct is to come to you and stay next to you. And then that's, that's how you end up with the dog that doesn't want to go hunt beyond leash range. And so mm-hmm. again, I don't I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because I swear I could preach about this for, <laughs> for an hour, but that yep. that is the most common quote unquote error I would say people do, especially on their first ones, is if you go watch a YouTube video on a lab trainer, you know, saying that the dog has to sit still for five minutes before they get their bowl of food, just recognize he's building a different machine than what you are. Mm-hmm. And Chesapeake Bay Retriever, Golden Retriever, Labrador Retriever, Duck Pulling Retriever. What's common with all those? Retriever. Okay. So they're natural retrievers. The, mm-hmm. the name tells you that. Never heard of a Vizsla Retriever, an EB Retriever, a Setter Retriever. They are not natural retrievers. They're supposed to be natural pointers. You build a high retrieve drive with a real young puppy, which is what a lot of people are after, you think it's going to make it easier or harder to steady that dog up on birds. Yeah. You know, and if they're, you know, a retriever is a flusher in the field. Okay. So they have to work within gun range. A pointer is they're going to be within gun range on occasion, but their job is to cover ground. So you don't have to, because if you're hunting, you know, partridge in Montana, you go to an excellent piece of ground, the section in size. You know how many coveys are out there? Maybe four. Yeah. And it's a covey. So you got four areas in 640 acres that have birds. Well, they have to want to go out and cover all that ground, and it takes time. So, uh, you know, uh, a pointing dog realistically should not be within gun range. Yeah. And... There's a lot of them that that's what they want. And I just ask, why don't you get a spring? Yeah. Why don't you get a lab? Get get the breed that fits how you want the hunt. 
and you know people it's, don't and and you, that's you, their you, choice yeah it's their choice you know it's their prerogative and at the end of the day you know whatever makes you happy right i mean mm-hmm. it, it, we're in the u.s you're free to make whatever decision that you want on yep. this right so uh, I'm an advocate for that, but just recognize, you know, for the people that say, you know, I want my dog working close to me because I don't, I don't want to run to my dog on point. Like if you train and develop the dog appropriately, I don't care if it's 300 yards out when they establish point, they should remain steady until you exactly. get there. You know, you're dealing with birds that, that, yeah, they may flush out prematurely, but if your dog is not moving and, you know, those birds might creep away slowly, but by the time you get up there and the dog self-releases or you release it and, and have it relocate, mm-hmm. all of that is built up into the training and the purpose of an actual pointing breed. And so, you know, it's like, hey, again, you buy a dog, you you want to rein it in. OK, that that's your choice. But then don't be disappointed if you have a pointing dog that's working within 20 yards of you the whole time and you're finding less birds than what the other people are doing. To your point, like if I want a dog within 25 yards of me all the time, I'm going to go get a Springer or Cocker or Lab or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's value in it. Like I'm not saying one is better than the other. Just recognize that they are two different things. Yep. And people that tell me I don't want to run my dog 300 yards out i don't run in the field with a loaded gun that that's that's somebody's going to get shot a dog's going to get shot bad things are going to happen the bird is if you, like you said if the dog does its job the bird is going to be there yeah yes a rooster may run okay but my dog if that bird starts running i expect him to break point and track that bird, point again, break point, keep doing it until it actually pins the bird. I don't want a dog that goes on point, even if it's 40 yards away, where it's not very far away, that won't break point on itself on a a bird like a rooster, uh, like a pheasant, that will run like a son of a gun. Because I don't want to walk up there, and there's no bird there. That just, you know, wasted my time and energy. Yeah. Keep contact with the bird, pin it down. We're good to go. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want anybody listening to this. Maybe if you're brand new to this, to think that uh, I, I was out of this equation. I was the one that you know. Hey, when your dog goes on point and you get that notification on the screen, when I first started out, I, I mean my pace definitely picked up if, if, I mean, there's a few times where, you know, I used to run when I first started out, but then once you start understanding this and you start recognizing, you start seeing the dogs that are properly developed and trained, you, you start realizing that you shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't have to run. And if you are, then it's time to go back to the drawing board. And that's what you're supposed to be addressing in the training field in between hunting season. But you also don't get those dogs that learn how to handle running birds and relocating without going to actually get on wild birds. Because at the end of the day, you know, I'm still waiting on that person to show me how you simulate a true running bird with uh, a pen raised quail or pheasant or anything like that. Fast cat. Fast cat. You know what that is? Is, is that it's an AKC competition? About, they have a lure. I was about to say, and they run it. I was about to say they're just chasing the the foxtail or whatever it is, right? Yeah, yeah. So you get a fast cat and just move it a little ways. Okay, move it a little ways. Sorry, I'm not going to spend the money, and you know <laughs> it, that would have to be on you know a lawn or anything. But I suppose you could do it that yeah. way if you really really wanted to. oh trust me i i've i've wasted many uh brain cells just trying to come up with creative solutions to simulate a running bird i mean me and my buddies mm-hmm. i mean years ago we we failed miserably at trying like i mean the the fishing rods you tie the bird to the the and i mean it's just it's a cluster oh, i never would have thought of that one <laughs> yeah yeah uh <laughs> i you know it sounds good on the face of it maybe like i can make that yep. work but you know it it it, it doesn't <laughs> no no so but uh 
Mark, I, I feel like you and I can keep, especially if we start going down the pet peeve and gripes session, I think that oh, you yeah. and I can talk for, for hours on this. So uh, when it comes to focusing and creating your plan and something, what what's something that we didn't really cover that uh, we should? What's something I should have asked you that we that I didn't? Uh, I can't think of anything. I think the, you know, one thing that people might overlook is uh, doing something to failure. Because I see that one all the time where a, the dog is doing really good. So let's do one more. And then they blow up. So make sure that that's part of your plan. Don't do it. To, you know, like I said, I plan no more than three birds. Okay. That's it. That session's done. So have that part as part of your plan. So you keep the dog, hopefully, on that. If it gets the, well, that, to the second one, it's excited. So you're, as they say, end on a happy note, on a good note, if at all possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to take that advice, ending on a happy note. I enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate you making time for me today. You bet, sir. Have a good day. You too.